Uh, hello there, dear viewers of uh, Insight on a Sunday channel. Uh, today, it is my great pleasure to uh, interview Dr. Begum Burak. Uh, she's a, a Turkish independent researcher who defended her PhD degree in 2015. Uh, she collab collaborated with various universities in Italy, in United Kingdom, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Spain. And, uh, she's interested in modern history, Turkish studies, uh, discourse analysis, media and politics, democratization matters, matters related to religion and politics, uh, secularism, democratic theory, comparative uh, democratization, matters related to military coup in Turkey, and political, political culture in Turkey and in the broader Balkan region. How are you, Dr. Uh, Burak? Very I'm good. fine, thank you very much. It's, I think it's fine, it's a real pleasure. Thank you very much, thank you very much for accepting uh, our invitation. My question to you is uh, about your uh, thesis, uh, your dissertation, which you defended in 2015 at uh, Fatih University. Uh, it was recently published as a book in 2022. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about your thesis and what kind of uh, change uh, took place since that time in Turkey? And uh, could you tell me if this is still relevant in your country? Yes, yes. First of all, I want to thank you very much, Dr. Peter, for your kind invitation. It's an honor to be here in your ch channel and to, to you know, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about my studies. Uh, yes, I... Um, Defended my PhD thesis like seven years ago, and uh, it was published as a book from Generis Publishing in the early 2020, uh, two, in early this year. Um, yes, lots of things have changed, as you mentioned, in Turkey since that time. After my graduation, um, a, a failed military coup attempt to place in Turkey in 2017. 16 and unfortunately uh, you know some it was one of these institutions uh which got closed down uh after the uh, failed military coup attempt uh, but luckily i had defended my thesis and you know i had the phd degree officially i became a doctor and i had the chance to uh, publish my thesis as a book uh yes uh, as you know, the main concept of my thesis is the concept of undesired citizenship uh Actually, this concept has been discussed by many scholars while talking about the equality discussions in Turkey and what kind of um, what kind of uh, citizens you know have faced discrimination um, in Turkey so far. So this is uh, actually a really dynamic um, uh, issue to discuss because uh, things have changed in Turkey. Uh, in my thesis, actually, I classified uh, four uh, different types of uh, undesired citizens. And one of them is the Kurdish citizens, uh, the other group is the non-Muslim citizens, the other is the Alevi people, and the other group was the practicing Muslims. But this can be uh, uh, classified as the undesired citizenship citizenship regime, you know, promoted in the early Republican period. So when uh, Turkey was founded as a secular republic, uh, it, the identity of Turkey has, was supposed to be um, Sunni, Muslim, Turkish, and also, you know, secular. So the practicing Muslims. Uh, non-Muslims like the Armenians and also Alevi people, the non the the group that uh, that don't adopt Sunni Islam, so all these were uh, seen as the others of the republic. But as as you said, uh, many things have changed. So uh, since uh, two thousand and two, AKP regime has been uh, ruling Turkey. So the practicing Muslims are no longer undesired. So the people you know wearing a scarf can be can work in the public offices and. Uh, but still the Kurdish people to some degree, the Alevis and the non-Muslims are still, uh, can be con conceptualized as the undesired citizens. Uh, so yes, uh, I agree with you, many things have changed. Uh, so I try to analyze the major discourses about this uh, citizenships. Um, for example, I selected some key events like the capture of Abdullah Ejelan, the leader of the PKK terrorist organization. And I try to analyze the Kurdish identity or, you know, with this, specific event so my it is, is really long it's long it, it is like uh, 557 pages long so i selected many many key events uh, uh related with each identity and i try to use critical discourse analysis and i try to look at two newspapers uh in terms of their circulation one was the you know Kemalist newspaper Hurriyet, 
as you know, maybe men, much uh, large uh, population was reading it. But from the conservative side, Zaman Daily was, was one of the best-selling dailies at that time period. So scientifically, uh, I chose these two newspapers and I tried to analyze them. In terms of content, it seems a bit, you know, undesired, <laughs> according to the to this Turkish academy at the moment. But I'm happy with my thesis. And thank you very much for asking me this question and to, you know, to tell about uh, my uh, study. You've mentioned about Zeyman Daily and it got closed in direct aftermath of the of the failed coup. Uh, could you tell me about the background behind this decision? And also my second following question would be how hard it is to be an academic in Turkey with your views? Thank you. That's a really good question and this, it's really important, I think. Well, uh, just a very short time after the failed coup attempt uh, in two, back in 2016, uh, the government you know, the state um, discourse uh, argued that this failed coup attempt was um, was uh, staged by the Gülenist network. So um, Gülen community, which once was seen as a, the movement of intercultural dialogue, uh, was, um, you know, named as a terrorist organization. But uh, actually, like, long time ago, like in, in late 2013, there was this conflict between the government and the Gulen community because of this, like the corruption scandals and other, you know, issues. Uh, so the, the picture is still not very clear, uh, to be honest, because the reports, um, uh, both from the local <clears throat> entities and also from the international organizations have not been, you know, uh, completely released about the background of the coup. But yes, many uh, institutions, like the newspapers, the universities affiliated with the Gülen group or the FETO, as they now call it, this terrorist group, the so-called terrorist group, they were all, all closed down. So it was just a real risk and a real uh, challenge for many scholars like me, because, you know, having been graduated from this school or, you know, uh, focusing on such on a newspaper like that. And my rhetoric was this, this newspaper was one of the best-selling dailies. Like it was a legal paper, you know, um, circulated all around Turkey and also abroad, but now it is seen as a terrorist group's paper. So it's really ch challenging. And many things have changed. As I said, the school got closed down, the newspapers, some banks got closed down, like Bank Asya, also affiliated with Gülen community. The financial, you know, uh, uh, lack of the community, we can say, but it's really, really complicated. So maybe it's it's topic of another video <laughs> because it's really, really long. But thanks for asking, and you know, thanks for talk uh, mentioning this. Definitely, thank you very much for your answers. Uh, could you tell me because your most recent uh, research relates to cyberspace and online freedom? Uh, could you tell us more about uh, internet freedom in? Turkey and uh, cyberspace discussions uh, in academia, basically, how uh, how free you are to conduct your research. Mm -hmm. Actually, in terms of freedom, I am free to conduct any kind of research, but in terms of publishing it or, you know, in terms of uh, talking about some specific details in the research, maybe it is not very, you know, uh, it's not very reasonable or it's not very good but yes i had published a paper like one year ago about online freedoms in cyberspace the online surveillance and the uh, erosion of online freedoms in in turkey actually the topic of cyberspace has uh, has attracted my attention for like a couple of years uh, i try to focus on this issues uh, issue and i think other scholars also it's a rising trend in the academia the cyberspace topic cybersecurity or um, you know metaverse and other stuff um but basically as a summary i can say this um online freedoms also have been under threat in the recent years because you you know that turkey has um adopted a, a presidential regime, a unique presidential regime, because it's unlike the American type of presidential regime, because there are no proper, uh, you know, checks and balances system. There is only one man rule, to be honest. Maybe it's also not very good to talk about this, but this one man rule, the president um, controls many, m most of the things in Turkey. So in terms of online freedoms, if you criticize, for example, the regime in a 
in a uh, print uh, Tutnisi paper, yes, it's also not very uh, recommended in Turkey. But if you also uh, circulate your ideas on Twitter, you don't have to have many followers or you don't have to be very, you know, uh, impactful um, social media character social media profile the thing is that if someone doesn't like you for example they can just get a screenshot of your twitter posts any critical post you don't have to uh, you don't have to you no know, um, say anything embarrassing or you know anything of a criminal uh, content but if you criticize maybe some people can get this as a uh, as an attempt to um how can i say um and then some... in your in your sphere of uh, work, basically try to jeopardize your career or something like that. I've heard many stories about yes. uh, f uh, my colleagues from Turkey who uh, face some form of uh, punishment for their views. Have you ever came across with this type of policy of the government impacting your personal freedoms? Mm -hmm. Actually, I didn't see anything personal, but I try to. I try to in exercise self censorship. So sometimes mm -hmm. when I post a tweet, I just read, oh, okay, this can be you know something harmful to me, and I just delete uh, my post. So this the self censorship is a is an important issue for bo both academics and also journalists in Turkey in recent years. Um, actually, I was talking about this. I couldn't remember the name of the article, but I also wrote an article about this. Uh, you know, criticizing presidents, but also uh, to be seen as a criminal because of that. So these are all very, really complex and interrelated issues. But in terms of this type, uh, these discussions in Turkey, it is a really new and interesting topic. Um, some people analyze it from technical um, perspective, but I try to analyze it from, you know, democracy theory, the freedom of speech and you know, uh, to what degree do we have freedom of speech while, uh, you know, exercising our online freedoms? So, uh, because also Turkey has passed a very recent uh, social media law, and some people name it as a law against disinformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, this, but who will decide what is disinformation? For example, I can post something, but uh, a, a person who doesn't like my idea can maybe see it as a disinform, uh, like ca some kind of this is for uh, not correct information, I mean. So these are all really important currently. But thanks for asking it, uh, really. And thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Dr. Burak, um, could you tell me about the future of Turkey? How do you perceive the future of Turkey under Erdogan regime? And uh, what, what would be the likelihood of uh, President Erdogan um, retiring from politics, because he has been uh, in active politics ever since, the, the national politics ever since 1999, I suppose. Yes, uh, yes, uh, he has been, you know, in the early 1990s, uh, he has been the mayor of uh, Istanbul um, uh, municipality, but he has been very active more than three decades yeah, uh, in, in active politics, yes. Uh, actually, the um, this question is, um, is can be, you know, answered in two different ways, because next year, Turkey uh, will witness a general elections in 2023 and these are really important in terms of uh, changing the you know maybe the regime type even the regime type because the opposing parties uh, defend the idea that this presidential regime regime is not democratic and many uh, of the opposing um, party leaders uh, argue that they will you know again return to the a, a parliamentary regime, which is more democratic and suitable for Turkey. So I think uh, Erdogan regime also has uh, has, fa has been facing big challenges in terms of this election propagandas. Yes, in Turkey today, media is not free, so not all the opposing actors, you know, do have access, equal access to media. And as I said, uh, the economic problems and the rising inflation and the unemployment problems will uh, will have a great impact on the future of Turkish politics. I think that Erdogan regime is not also as strong as it, as, uh, it used to be. Uh, the main opposition uh, bloc is also, you know, um, has, has 
an important degree of support based on the opinion polls and in some other reports published by uh, uh, independent organizations. So I think Turkey will uh, will face a radical change uh, next year in after 2023 elections. So these elections will show what will happen in Turkish politics. If, if you allow, can I ask you about um, the Turkish foreign policy a little bit? Um, my in, my question would be related to uh, Turkish role in Syrian conflict and in Ukrainian conflict, uh, with uh, also some emphasis on uh, the way Turkey is helping Syrian refugees, because Turkey has been hosting uh, Syrian refugees, like more than 4 million Syrian refugees ever since uh, the beginning of uh, the Syrian uh, uprising, the Arab Spring in Syria, uh, that dates back to 2011. What's your view on, on, on the way the government is handling this issue? Thank you, thank you. Actually, the migration issue is something that I didn't focus on much, but um, from my point of view, Turkey also has a great you know, numbers of uh, refugees, uh, but now in terms of domestic politics, uh, this, this, this refugee problem has been on the agenda because many people, uh, uh, you know, from the Turkish uh, society criticize uh, the government now because the, there is a rising unemployment and inflation in Turkey. And um, uh, may, may some people think that these refugees also are a burden upon the shoulders of Turkish citizens. So maybe also I want to, you know, do you do would you agree with me in, the, in terms of this migration and the refugee issue? I think you also have some studies, uh, have some research about this. And also, uh, yes, the Syrian crisis. I don't know very much about the military aspect of the crisis, but it's important. Maybe you have something to say more than me. Um, I suppose that uh, when it comes to uh, Turkey and Poland, we have pretty much similar situation when it comes to refugees, because Turkey hosts like more than 4 million Syrian refugees, and Poland uh, hosts more than 3 million Ukrainian refugees these days. Uh, so um, on, on some levels, uh, our countries meet certain uh, obligations towards the populations which are uh, the most uh, exposed, let's say, to uh, to some sort of violence from their uh, countries of origin. Um, if I may ask, the, I think the final question I would uh, ask you about the Turkish drone production and export to, to Ukraine. How important is that in warming up Turkish image around the world? Because uh, he has been known for for supporting Ukrainian government but uh, on the other hand it's it supported uh, Azerbaijan in its uh, recent uh, conflict with Armenia with the same uh, type of drones so what's your intake on on in in this uh, respect thank you for this question uh, yes this is also a really important topic while it's you know analyzing the impact of this uh, drone production and selling them to other states and how it uh, impacts the image of Turkish foreign policy abroad. Um, I had uh, uh, presented an, a paper in a conference last uh, last uh, last year about this topic, the Bayraktar TB2 drones and uh, how they affected uh, Turkish foreign policy image. Uh, as you know, uh, the son-in-law of Erdogan produces these uh, drones and also in uh, uh, Selçuk Bayraktar has been covered in the by the Western media to to an important degree. Uh, he has been interviewed by big, you know, uh, Western um, media outlets lately. Uh, I think it's really important because not only Ukraine, but also as you mentioned, the uh, in Azerbaijan conflict, and uh, there are you know like more than twenty. Um, uh, different um, numbers of uh, drones were sold so far. Uh, I think it's it's really important and it has a really positive impact on Turkish foreign policy because this is an image that Turkey is not dependent on foreign uh, infrastructure for producing this such kind of weapons. So it's, it's really important, I think. Okay. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you very much for your time. 
and I wish you all the best in your research. And I hope that our academic collaboration will extend beyond this interview. Thank you so much for giving me the time and you know for giving me this your space to talk about my studies, my research. It is a real pleasure and it's a real opportunity. Thanks a lot, Dr. Peter. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Hello. Thanks.